Good morning. I am starting this reading vlog pretty much just after I finished the last reading vlog, which you don't need to have seen for continuity, but I mentioned in the last reading vlog that I haven't been reading as much as I would have liked to this past month, mainly because I've been judging a competition, so that's been taking up a lot of my reading eye space time is that a thing anyway um so for the last week of october which this is i would like to do two things i'm going to read by whim because i finished judging for the moment we've got our long list sorry if you can hear the washing machine and um, we've got our long list and we have our shortlist meeting in a few weeks so i'm going to take this week to forget about that for a second and read by whim but also read for two hours every day that's going to be my aim not a solid two hours at a time probably you know 15 minutes while i'm eating my lunch 15 minutes in the morning before i get up half an hour before bed that's kind of the goal i just want to get back into the routine of reading more for pleasure and not just for work because at the moment all of my reading has been for work which is fine but you know i miss my bookshelves so I left you last time having just finished reading, or I was just about to finish reading Piranesi by Susanna Clarke, and I absolutely love this. This actually was for work, but it was one I got to choose because I um, run a book club for Toast, which is a clothing company, but they have a magazine as well. And that was a book I wanted to review for October. By the time this goes up, that review should be up. So I'll link it in the description box down below. But basically, I thought that the novel was such a beautiful constellation of a book. It's a book that inspires you to think about all of the unknown worlds that you have visited in fiction before and try and piece together knowledge based on that and apply it to this fictional world that she has created. It made me think of Arcadia by Ian Pierce. It made me think of Lyra and her alethiometer. It made me think of that scene in Return to Oz, the most terrifying sequel of all time where Dorothy has to try and work out which objects in this vast room of antiques are her friends that have been transformed into emerald pieces. Um, I loved it and I think there's an extra layer to add to that when you think about Susanna Clarke writing this after she became chronically ill and navigating time in a strange way, which um, we disabled and chronically ill people understand very well indeed. So I thought it was great, loved it. I will link my review in the description box down below. So I thought today, um, it is about half nine at the moment and I got up early, I couldn't sleep last night and I've already done email admin. So I'm gonna take an hour right now, I think about an hour to do some laundry <laughs> and uh, also put the food shop away because that arrived today, this morning. And uh, in general, make this flat look a bit tidier because at the moment it doesn't look like that. You know that stage in the middle of tidying where you're moving things between rooms and it makes it worse before it gets better? That's where we're at right now. So I'm gonna fix that. I also, um, if you can see in this light, did my nails yesterday uh, in this, is that coming up? I can't tell. Anyway, it's orange, but with a glitter top coat, which future self is gonna hate me for when it comes to taking that off because we all know that glitter nail varnish is a pain but I was inspired by Lauren over at Lauren in the books she's been doing outfits October where she puts prompts in a jar and every day she takes one out and plans an outfit around it and one of them was school disco and I was like oh school disco I didn't really used to enjoy school discos all that much but I thought I would like to paint my nails Halloween school disco I never wore nail varnish back then because I was too um self-conscious so this is a this is for past me um what else can I tell you books that's why we're here okay so the book I think I'm going to pick up next and I'm going to start listening to as I uh, clean and do laundry and all of the life admin stuff I am going to listen to my physical copy is up there somewhere I will insert uh, the front cover here Brown Baby by Nikesh Shukla which is his memoir and I've been meaning to pick that one up for a while I thought okay I would really like to listen to that on audio um, and this morning Kendra over at Kendra Winchester if you don't follow her I'll link her channel in the description box down below wrote a great article for Book Riot on why we need to stop asking the question do audiobooks count as reading um, and looking at 
audiobooks through the lens of accessibility, which is primarily what they're for. Yes, we can read audiobooks to enjoy them, and I do that as well, but I also read them because sometimes I need to use those. That's definitely been the case historically when I've been recovering from operations and couldn't physically hold books. Um, and now with my eyesight changing, it's handy for me to go between physical and audio. It's a great article. I'll link that in the description box down below. I'm going to start listening to that book and when I have thoughts on it, I will come back and talk to you. But for now, shall we have a satisfying speed clean? Let's do that. Hey, later on on the same day the flat is looking clean so I am feeling cleansed um, I listened to a good chunk I say a good chunk like an hour of Nikesh Shuklo's book while I was cleaning and I'm really enjoying it it's written as a letter to his daughter and the first section is on talking to his daughter about race and I'm into the second section now which is talking to his daughter about gender and I will speak about it properly when I'm when I'm further in and have more thoughts and have more time because I'm just checking in now between bits of work um, but I've just been filming videos for bookshops for The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers which as I'm sure you know is my new book please do purchase it that would make me very happy or get it out from your local library and I thought I would go full on Halloween you know not just the Halloween school disco nails that I mentioned earlier but black top orange dungarees and orange wig so that was fun and now I need to edit those, caption them and get them sent off. But I thought I would also mention the physical book that I'm gonna pick up either this evening or tomorrow, whenever. Um, and it's this one here, which is beautifully shiny. This is Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith. Desperately want to read more of her work. So this is about a marriage where there is no love in it anymore and the wife is very openly having affairs maybe even to annoy her husband, <laughs> like she tells him about them and he's really, really frustrated by this. And then one of the people, according to the blurb that she's having an affair with, dies and the husband very brazenly says, yes, well, I killed him. But did he? What's going on? I don't know, her writing's always brilliant. So once I've started that, I'll come back to you and speak to you about that too. I also wanna to talk to you about list making and making a non-work list, but I have to go work now so we can talk about that later um there is a whole period mainly focused around uh, the victorian times where science and freak shows and storytelling primarily folklore kind of come together in this big i'm going to call it a circus in this big this circus of storytelling it was a time when authors and storytellers were panicking because they thought they should be incorporating science into their writing for children gone were the times of like innocence it was all about well not gone but it was it was more about how can we teach children things instead of giving them fairy stories because that's what was fashionable science was really cool so like, right how can we do this so there are amazing fairy tales where fairies would balance equations and you could count elements on fairies wings and a lot of upper class uh, Victorian children would have microscopes at home so they could look at things and the Thames was called monster soup because people had realised how disgusting it was because they looked at it under a, a microscope and 
there was this mythology flying around that if germs existed and those were bad, then maybe fairies were things that also existed but were too small for us to see and that fairies could combat the germs. And in the UK, we still have fairy washing up liquid, which is like my favourite fact. That's why we have fairy washing up liquid, because it was thought that the fairies in it would clean your kitchen. (laughs) I just think that's really great. Um, And then in freak shows, which were so popular during the Victorian times, People um, like P.T. Barnum and other freak show owners would create folklore for disabled people in their shows and they would use disabled people as in inverted commas proof of evolution they would say okay well this person is part lion and part person so they're part animal they're not fully human this is proof of evolution this is their origin story Uh, everyone come and come and see them and whilst i would love to be referred to as a mythical creature that would be very nice um it's also obviously quite messed up and and not cool i think now is a time to reclaim that and retell them uh, and put our own stamp on them really hi that last clip that you saw or rather listened to was an extract from a podcast that i did for reading women this week on the history of fairy tales i'll link that in the description box down below if you're interested and i also recorded a podcast with in the reading corner which i also think is going up this week so i'll put a snippet of that later in the vlog too. It's a couple of days later um, and I am three and a half hours into Brown Baby by Nikesh Shukla. Um, I really love the way that he's discussing family in this book in, in various different ways and how he's also talking about food which I think is often done in memoir and often we link food with grief and I think that's due to lots of different things but like sensory reasons right like taste and smell are the things that conjure memories for us most and in this case he's talking about his mother and his mother was someone who cooked a lot for him and he has all of these memories that he's piecing together which mirror each other so wonderfully in the way that he's assembled them so He's looking back on his childhood about how whenever he got home from school, his mum would always make him change out of his school uniform because though she was cooking, she didn't want the smell of the spices on his clothes because she didn't want him to get bullied at school. But of course, he says the smells coming out of the kitchen were wonderful and amazing. And he got bullied anyway, (laughs) whether or not that smell attached itself to his clothes or not. But then now that his mother has passed away, he's really craving that that smell that's coming from the kitchen and there's just just this beautiful scene where he's in the kitchen and looking at this empty fridge and then he opens the freezer which is also almost empty but then he finds this frozen meal that his mum had made and oh god it makes me want to cry and then he defrosts it and eats it and suddenly the house is just full of all of the the smells of her cooking and then he goes on a mission to try and recreate the recipes but hilariously that this book of recipes that he's been given by his family have no measurements in or, or times or anything like that and he's trying to decipher it like it's some kind of test so i'm really enjoying that and as i said i'm about three and a half hours of the way through the audiobook and i think the audiobook is about eight hours in total. I have started reading Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith and I've only read the first 50 or so pages and the tension in it is so delightful. I could totally imagine Kate Blanchett playing the role of the wife in this. As I mentioned before, it's about husband and wife who don't really love each other anymore. The wife is openly having affairs and it's really funny because the husband is so fed up, Vic, that he decides to start telling people that he killed one of her previous friends, close friends, um, because this man did die. But you think that he's making it up? I have no idea, so this is not a spoiler, I have no idea. Um, The tone implies that he is making this up, that he hasn't killed anyone at all. But I don't know, I think it's because it's Patricia Highsmith. I'm like, really though, has he forgotten? Is he pretending to himself that he never did it? But he just keeps on slipping it into conversations at parties that, you know, did you know that he killed this man, Ralph? Did you hear that he went missing? Did you hear that he died? Yeah, that was me. Um, And there's all of this music going on in the background and everyone's drinking and having a merry time. And then there'll just be this cold corner of a room where he's whispering these things to people and people aren't sure if he's drunk, like his friends. Are you drunk? Are you okay, Vic? Are you just angry and you're saying this? Are you making stuff up? But slowly but surely these rumours start to get about town that he is someone who has murdered 
another man. Because it's not just that she openly has affairs in front of him. They go to parties and dinner parties and she will bring her boyfriend <laughs> with her and it's always a different person like every few weeks. It's an interesting swap as well when it comes to gender because I think it really challenges narratives surrounding affairs that you'll often see in books. If a man is constantly having affairs with other women and bragging about that with his friends, and you do have friends who are okay with that, they'll be slapping the man on the back and telling him he's doing a great job and wonderful how exciting they would admire him. But in this book, because it's the woman who's doing it, I'm not saying that behavior is correct by the way, but in the book, because it's a woman who's doing it, she is treated so differently by the people around her. Um, she is seen as an embarrassment, like no one is congratulating her at all. Um, and obviously all of this behaviour that we're talking about is, is, is flawed and not particularly nice. I just mean it's interesting to see the difference in people's reactions to this behaviour based on the gender of the person who's doing the cheating. So I'm really liking that so far. I was going to talk to you about non-work related lists but my camera battery is flashing at me so I'll leave that for the next clip and instead I will insert some footage of a pie that I made for dinner last night, a mushroom and leek pie and I made rough puff pastry and I will link the recipes that I based both of those things on in the description box down below. I tweaked them slightly but um, they're the, the basis for the meal that I made last night. It was a very hearty autumnal meal and I recommend it. Oh hey, it's the weekend and I now have charge on my camera so I can finish saying what I was saying in that last clip. I would like to advocate for making lists. And I don't just mean lists for work or lists for life admin and things that have to get done, though I of course love those very much and make too, well do I make too many of them? I make a lot of them. They just help keep my brain in order because I mean that's their job isn't it but today I want to advocate for making lists of things to remind yourself of nice things that you could do um, and I've seen obviously lots of people doing this it is not a new idea that I have invented but I remember Sana making a specific autumn list last year and I just thought that was lovely and then I didn't end up doing it myself but I wanted to do it this year. Life is still very insular for us at the moment so this is not a list of exciting day trips to go on or restaurants to go to or things to see at the cinema, it's nothing like that at all. It's um, small things that we can do around the house or walks that we could we could go on locally um, and I talk about lots of things on this channel obviously and I'm very open about many things but I also have boundaries because boundaries are really healthy things to have but I also think that uh, not talking about things 
it obviously gives a very selective view of someone's life, um, lovely walks and baking and, and reading and all of that stuff and genuinely lovely things like those things and also book releases and stuff. But um, at the moment I have lots of other things going on and hospital stuff is really kicking my bum at the moment. And I'm just basically a massive ball of anxiety. <laughs> um, and there are big life things going on that we can talk about in the future but I don't really want to talk about now and I don't say that to be all interesting and mysterious I just say it to contextualize and you know as a reminder that we all have got stuff going on that we don't always share so this list is important to me and I imagine that it will be important to other people as well if you decide to sit down and make one um I remember Mercedes saying once that sometimes she spends too much time in between reading books trying to work out what she wants to read next so she wastes reading time and I feel like I can do that in my spare time with uh, deciding what to do because I'm feeling really anxious and anxiety plays with time in a really odd way that I still am struggling to understand. So this list is not a way to make spare time productive but as a reminder of, look, these are things, nice things for you to choose from to kind of stop my brain fixating on not nice things. Okay, so this is the list that I have made of nice small things that I would like to do this autumn, winter. And I would love to know what things would be on your list if um, you made one for this autumn, winter. So I've split it into categories. I have a to watch category. And on the list right now for that, which I will add to as we go, I will have um, Truffle Hunter, which is a documentary. I thought it had pigs in it, but it doesn't. I think it's about older men and their dogs and hunting for truffles to sell to restaurants. I think it's mostly set in Italy. It just looks like the most stunningly filmed documentary ever. And I will insert a clip on the screen so you can see the cinematography. It is ah, chef's kiss. Um, I want to rewatch the Batman trilogy. Um, I, I don't know, that's just on my list. I need to catch up with Bake Off. I am behind. It is a disgrace that I am behind. At the moment, I'm not sleeping well. I'm getting about four hours of sleep a night. Not good. So this morning I woke up at four, but I did then manage to catch up on a couple of episodes of Bake Off. So that was a, a bit of a win. I am very much excited for the third season of What We Do in the Shadows, which is coming out in the UK in November, I think. It's already out in the States. Um, something I've already crossed off my list is the new series of Lock and Key, which I enjoyed but didn't love as much as the first one. And then I really, really want to watch The Only Murders in the Building, which so many of you have recommended to me because it is crime, but I think it's cosy and funny, um, but also a bit twisted. Just a mix of all the things that I like, but it's on Disney Plus, so I need to get that butt hack hack for me. Don't know if it's hack for anyone else. I do know that I need to get a new tariff on my phone because my contract is up for renewal and I'm pretty sure that I can get six months free of Disney Plus with the new contract. So that's exciting. Right, so that's on my watch list right now. Then I have a to eat list where I've made a list of cookbooks that I really would like to make recipes from. I think we're all guilty, or at least I hope that we're all guilty of having cookbooks on our shelves that we do a handful of recipes from and then we don't do the rest of them in the book and I would just like to be a bit more diligent in that respect. One of the things I wanted to make was also the pie that I made uh, two nights ago. What day is it? Yeah, two nights ago. <laughs> I couldn't remember for a second. Yes, it is Saturday. On Thursday I made that pie. Um, and then I want to try and make sweet potato lasagna. I've been making lasagna a lot recently, but in a gusto shop that we had a few months ago, there was a sweet potato, like more creamy based lasagna than tomato. And I'd like to recreate that. And I'd like to make toasted tea cakes. I've made them once before and they weren't very successful. I would like to try again. And yesterday I bought Miss M and I a Matsudai ramen kit. And can I just recommend this to UK viewers because it is the most delicious thing. I'd had it once before in the summer and this is definitely more the time to, to eat ramen, obviously, because it is colder. They do, um, I was gonna say international delivery. No, they don't. They do national delivery and they also do freezer kits, which are really well priced, I think. 
uh, and they also do vegan ones too and I will link their website in the description box down below they do handmade noodles and the broth is incredible and it's just amazing so I would recommend that so that's on my to eat list and then I have a list of board games that I want to play there are some board games I've listed that we haven't played in a while and there are a couple that we have not played at all so Ticket to Ride London was a gift that I got earlier in the year which I hadn't yet played until Mr M and I played it this morning and it's a really quick game it's the short version of the the main game I think there are lots of different versions but that's really fun and I think probably took us about 10-15 minutes to play once we had understood the rules so if you're looking for a short game to play I would recommend that one and then this was a gift from Mercedes which we haven't played yet which is called Kanagawa which looks like the most stunning board game just the way that it's illustrated uh, reminds me a little bit of Arboretum and this looks beautiful and it is a card based game and Miss M and I really do like card based games so that's something that I would also like to play I've also made a list of local walks that we could do I mean they kind of are the same walk because it's going to the same area because it's where we live but just different ways of doing those walks changing it up a little bit um I have been listening to which filters into books um Day of the Dead on audio which is the final Frida Klein book um and I was listening to that while cooking yesterday um and they talk about psychogeography in that and how even walking around your local area in a different way is is a great thing to do and listening to that reminded me that we should do that more often because we do stick to the same paths quite a bit so that's what i have been listening to i realized that i was listening to brown baby and i still am listening to that but i took a slight detour to listen to something that i already know inside out if you're new here nikki french i love have read all of their books have made a video recommending where to start with them which i will link in the description box down below sorry about that how rude yeah I needed to listen to something that I knew inside and out as I was um as I was cooking so I listened to a couple of hours of this probably going to go for one of those autumnal walks this weekend so I'll insert footage of that and then come back to you to talk about books so far I am sticking to the two hours a day I'm not being very rigid about it I think one day I read one hour 50 and you know another day I read two and a half hours so whatever but the reason that I'm doing this wasn't to be very precise about it. it was more to encourage me to pick up more books and keep going because I knew that it would make me feel better. It's always nice to be reminded that that holds true.
I don't want to lose this point, uh, but you talked about, you know, representation in the fairy tales. And you have a story in here that is not heteronormative either. The only story that you use the word beautiful in, I believe. Tell us a little bit about that story. I have two stories. The one that you mentioned, there is the souls trapped under the ocean, which is an Irish folktale and can also be found in Europe as well. And this is about a man who falls in love with a merman. And the original tale also seemed to suggest this as well. It didn't use the word love, but it was pretty clear that this man adored this merman, was very infatuated with him. And the merman is not, (laughs) not a very nice person. He likes to capture the souls of people to elongate his life. It's tricky because... Uh, very aware of the trope of the gay person dies at the end. But this is also not a collection of happy love stories. So I did want to keep the ending of that spoiler of that particular tale because the man, he loves the merman, but he doesn't agree with his with his practices of killing people, which, you know, is, is fair enough. Um, so he's trying to find a way to stop that happening so that they can coexist, but it doesn't particularly go very well. And stories of mermaids are particularly important in queer folklore, and I use the word folklore in a more cultural sense as well, that transformation of body. In fact, The Little Mermaid, it's argued that Hans Christian Andersen wrote that tale because he was in love with his best friend, Edward Collins. So it was um, a metaphor for falling in love with someone who you couldn't be with. So that is one of the tales in the book, but there's also another tale which is about a princess who falls in love with a woman and uh, that one does have a happily ever after. I was going to have a happy relationship in the book. I wanted it to be uh, a queer relationship. There's one happy straight relationship and one happy uh, queer relationship in the book. Hello, it is the end of the weekend and I thought I would wrap up this vlog here and talk to you about what I've read since I last checked in because this vlog is now five days old and I feel as though 10 hours plus of reading is is enough because I feel like this this vlog is going to be quite long already. So these are the books that I have been reading in this experiment and I have read over 10 hours and I will break down the reading time for you as I talk about these books. I have read five books, um, not in their entirety, (laughs) no, Um, but I have been reading five books and my reading is still erratic but previously my reading was erratic but it wasn't very substantial now my reading is erratic but it has been substantial so that has to be an improvement so let's break it down over the last five days i read three hours worth of the audiobook of day of the dead by nikki french i enjoyed it obviously i won't speak about it here because it's the last book in a series and i've spoken about it before i've also listened to five hours of the audiobook of brown baby by nikesh shukla and i'm continuing to really enjoy this it's a very casual book and I don't mean that in the sense of it being surface level or anything like that at all I mean it in the sense that it's written as a letter to his daughter and it's a privilege to be part of such a familial conversation this is not uh, an academic book where he says okay so this chapter daughter I'm talking to you about climate change and these are all of the theses that I've read and now this is my definitive conclusion on what we should do about climate change it's just This is an introduction to my personal thoughts as a parent on all of these topics and how those topics have become bigger and more complex now that I am a parent. It's how do we navigate big nebulous things whilst also living in the moment with the people that we care about? How do we be kind to each other? But at the same time, how do we protect ourselves against prejudice? Like there are just lots of thoughts in here that are both well articulated and forgiving to himself whilst also being serious both in happy ways and sad ways and and angry ways and all the spaces in between so I'm really enjoying this book so far then I am about halfway through Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith um, and I've probably spent about two hours reading this book I would think, at least. Um, And I am loving it. I can't really say more about it plot-wise than I said before because that will be spoilers, but it's really got to the stage now in the novel where I really want to keep reading it because the plot has really ramped up. Lots of things are happening. It's extremely tense. I think I said before that I can imagine Kate Blanchett playing the wife in this. Um, And I think I say that because Patricia Highsmith's writing is so... I was gonna say familiar to me I've only read three of her books but I feel like it's so familiar to me and 
um, Kate Blanchett plays Carol in the film version of Carol. <laughs> um, but I looked up this and actually there is going to be a film adaptation of it next year, a new one, with Ben Affleck playing the husband Vic. Uh, Kate Blanchett is not playing his wife. And it's interesting now because now I'm reading it, imagining Ben Affleck as as Vic. It's interesting that a lot of Patricia Highsmith's stuff is now being adapted again. There's going to be a new version of The Talented Mr. Ripley, which I think is also coming out next year. I'm very much here for it. So again, if you're into reading things before they come out on TV or at the cinema, then maybe pick up Deep Water. I'm really, really liking it. And I also realised it could have been confusing before when I was talking about how people just accepted men having affairs, but I think I forgot to mention that this is set in the 1950s and also written in the 1950s because that's when she was writing. <laughs> so I hope that contextualises it a little bit more. But if you want to read about messy relationships and revenge, then I think this one is for you. I haven't finished it yet, so maybe I won't enjoy the ending, but so far, really liking it. I read this picture book by Julia Sada, and I have read books that she has illustrated before, but I've never read books that she's written. So I read The Lists, I'll insert the cover here, and I also read one about a wolf, which I've forgotten the name of, but I'll put the cover here. Her artwork is so beautiful. She is one of my absolute favorite illustrators, but I'd never read her writing before. This is called The Queen in the Cave. And this book, I really can't stop thinking about it. And part of me wants to recommend it more to grown-ups than to children. Let me explain why. So this is about three children who go on an adventure because the eldest child, the eldest daughter, they're all, all girls, wants to go to visit the queen who she thinks lives at the end of the garden. So all three sisters trundle through the garden and then they meet this queen who looks very much like their eldest sister. And it's at this point that the two younger sisters say, we're scared and we want to go home. So the siblings split and the eldest sister goes off to hang out with the queen who looks like her and the two younger sisters go back home. And then in the evening, when their elder sister comes back, she's changed and different. And I think as a reader, we're left to wonder whether or not she's swapped places with the queen or, or what has happened. It's one of those books where I think children will re read it one way. It's very creepy. The illustrations lend themselves to too creepy. They're so abstract and surreal as well. It's like Alice in Wonderland. Um, just hitting myself, hitting my glasses with it. I absolutely love the illustrations. They are incredible. I think children will read it thinking it's a creepy story about a sister who wants to go and visit a magical place in an Alice in Wonderland, Narnia, His Dark Materials kind of way. But I think if you read it as an adult, you read it in a different kind of way. And I think as an adult, I read it as a metaphor for, for growing up and how scary growing up can be. And that tricky relationship that I imagine happens with a tight knit group of siblings where one is breaking away and doing things that the others don't particularly understand. That might be going to school and making friends, having a life outside of the family unit and that disconnect being really jarring and upsetting for the younger sisters. I think it can even be read in a more sinister way in that the older sister is doing things to grow up because she feels she should in the same way that you can read Peter Pan in a very innocent-ish kind of way as a child. But if you revisit that novel as an adult, there are so many um, things going on that you just do not see when you're a child. And I've made a whole video about the discussions we could have about performance within Peter Pan, which I'll link in the description box down below. Then I started reading this, which is a short story collection by Lucy McKnight Hardy called Dead Relatives. And I thought this would be brilliant for Halloween. It sounded super creepy. And I've read the first story, which is 66 pages long. So it's a good chunk of the book. It's probably a third of the book, at least. Yeah, it's, it's a third of the book. And, um, I don't I I don't know and I'm kind of like nervous laughing because this this story made me feel really vulnerable and not not in a good way <laughs> um and I'm torn because I I read the story and I was thinking this writing is superb the writing is wonderful she is so good with with voice and pacing and atmosphere it's about a 13 year old girl called Iris who lives in a house with her mother with cook and with Pete 
and they are running a business where the ladies come and visit them and Iris can kind of channel the voices or feels like she can channel the voices of her dead relatives which essentially live in paintings on the walls and you're not sure what what their business is and I love that kind of setup um, and I've written stories like that before myself I wrote a story called Aunt Libby's Coffin Hotel which is about an aunt and niece and they they run a, a haunted um hotel where people can come and stay in coffins I, I love that isolated setting of guests coming to a mysterious place and they don't really know what they're what they're in for but I don't really know what the the message of this story was as I was reading it Iris is a very opinionated young girl and I love reading questionable narrators I suppose and especially when they're young girls and they're trying to navigate the world but they have prejudices thrust upon them that they're still kind of trying to shrug sh sh shrug off that society has you know put on them so Iris is very judgmental about Cook because she has a lazy eye and she calls Pete clippity cloppity Pete because he has a piece of um, shrapnel in his leg and he has a limp um, she's very critical about her mother's appearance and it turns out that she herself has a facial disfigurement and is disabled. And there are just lots of comments throughout the story about how, you know, no one would ever sleep with her. And um, people look at her with, with pity and with disgust. And I'm all for talking about social elements of disability and how people interact with that and critiquing it. I don't feel like this story did that. In fact, it kind of felt like this story was more about parents of disabled children being so jealous of people who don't have disabled children that they want to kill and mutilate their children. It also does heavily rely on trying to creep out the reader with its descriptions of disability and disfigurement it's supposed to unnerve the reader you can tell that by the way that appearances are described and I mean I feel like a broken record at this point obviously because I'm like can we just stop doing this but can we just stop doing it? can we just stop doing it um I realise that this is a particularly sensitive topic for me, especially when she's talking about things like cleft lips and, you know, having ears that need operations on and, and scars and um, not having much hair and her eyes being, like, weird or whatever. Like, it feels very much like a child who has accidental dysplasia. It just does. But <sighs> I said more things. I spoke for a few more minutes, but actually I'm just, I'm just going to stop. I'm just going to stop. Um... It's, it's hard because as, as a critic, you know, there are things to recommend the story, as I mentioned, like it is very well written, but I'm also a human being. So I am, like any of us, bringing my own lived experience to a book. And it's not like I'm saying, I think every author anywhere should understand what I specifically want in a book. I'm just, for the umpteenth time, pointing out that disabled people are a large minority. We are one in four or one in five, depending on where you happen to be. And we deserve better than this kind of discussion and representation. It's just, it makes me really sad. I mean, yesterday, Mr. M and I watched, because I did get, I did get Disney Plus subscription because I did upgrade my phone and we watched uh, Black Widow, the, the standalone film of Black Widow. And, and yes, of course, the bad guy had facial disfigurements and was disabled. And it's just like, it's just this deflation. I would like us to, to just stop just stop um so yes writing great apart from that but you know for me personally reading that it just made me really sad and i don't know if i now want to read more and see if you know those tropes aren't revisited in other stories or if i would just like to go okay that one's not for me for other people perhaps who have the privilege of being able to ignore stuff like that then it's for them but not for me on a nice note i did as i said get disney plus and we have started watching The Only Murders in the Building. And I am loving it. So thank you for that recommendation. It is, as you described to me, it is murder mystery, three people who are really into true crime podcasts, um, who come together across ages living in this huge apartment block to try and solve a murder that's happening in their building. But there are lots of things going on below the surface. And it's both funny and dark. 
and it's great. So we can end on a happy note by saying that. So this experiment went well. I did read over 10 hours worth of worth of books um, and that was that was a great time. So thank you for joining me for this reading vlog. I hope that your reading is going okay at the moment and if it's not and you would like it to be, I hope that it improves for you soon. Um, I'm sending lots of love to you all and I will see you in a new video very soon. Bye.